be fair. So um, I'm probably best to be involved with more cerebral pursuits. Yeah, that's yeah. a fairly said. Well, Auckland's Justin Pocock is someone who came late to building. He had turned 40 when he began to consider it, and he's joining us now. Good afternoon, Justin. Hey, James. How are you? Very well. How long have you been building now? Uh, 18 months now and uh, two months um, into an apprenticeship. Some people dream about it because they know the demand and they'd love to have the skill that you're learning, but they obviously find it tough. What's the hardest aspect? Um, well, for me, I mean, I pretty much like, because I'm practically minded, um, you know, like making things and fixing things, um, oh, I don't find too many things hard, but I guess if I had to give an answer, it would be, um, you know, with all the, um, I guess it's the constant sort of physicality of the job, day in, day out, grovelling in small spaces for an old guy, up and down scaffolding, um, you know, getting all your, your bits and pieces and your printy caught, caught up and things. But, I mean, for me, that's pretty minor. You know, it's um, it's worth that sort of daily struggle to, to do what I do. You're not an old guy yet, but should other old guys consider it? If, you know, if you've had this experience, uh, do you think a lot of people could do it? Oh, yeah, totally, totally. If you're, you know, if you've been thinking about it, if you do like to, you know, twiddle in the shed and make things and pull things apart and you're... Um, maybe you know sick of being stuck in an office absolutely give it a go give it a go um, one of the um, other guys who was in our company he I mean he'd been a cabinet maker um, or kitchen uh, maker for a number of years and he got out and did an apprenticeship at 60 wow so um, yeah 60. yeah no if you're physically able um, then give it a go it's great fun Women are beginning to turn to the trades I was reading today more, but not in great numbers. I'm assuming a building career would suit quite a few of them. Uh, yeah, why not? Um, give it a go. Again, if you like, you know, being sort of, uh, you know, being um, physical and you're practically minded and you don't want to get stuck in an office, then, um, you know, do it. And if they're worried about the lack of strength, well, you know, for lifting beams and, and doing that sort of thing, well, we generally have at least, you know, two people working together, if not more. So there's always, you know, um, hands around to lift that and put that there. And, um, yeah, no, I think uh, women well, we should go absolutely get into it. What is the most satisfying aspect of it for you, just finally, Justin? Um, I'd say, you know, at the end of the day, looking back and um, hopefully having not <laughs> mucked too many things up and just seeing, you can physically see, you know, what you've achieved um, in, in, in a day. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun for somebody who's, uh, who loves that sort of thing. Thank you, and good of you to talk to us, Justin Pocock, an Auckland awesome. builder. Thanks, James. You see, the way he describes it, there's the glory right there, isn't it? Uh-huh. With climate change, it's probably a bit better too, isn't it? There's not, not so many frosty mornings and up here in the north, winterless north. It may take time to manifest fully in your new career. <laughs> 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 I guess if you're starting at 45, it might be a bit late. I'll ask you one quick question before. I don't have time to explain it, but it's the stories all over the media this morning about the UFOs, the UFO spotted by the Nimitz uh, battle group. I can hear the music already. Where do UFOs come from? Oh, I've got tin foil on my head. I can't say too much, Jim. Oh, OK, you're sworn to secrecy. Yep. By the aliens? I am. I haven't really done this conversation justice. What do you think? Oh. I believe there are aliens. Yes, why not? Probably was a UFO from somewhere in deep space, UFO land. Mike Rehu, thank you for being on the panel today. It's been a pleasure. Nice to see you. You too. Good luck with the rugby commentary. Sally Winley, always good to see you. You too, Jim. Thank you for your company, everybody. Uh, We're back tomorrow. Checkpoint now. Welcome to Checkpoint and thank you for joining us. It will cost $886 million and we'll see all cattle on infected properties culled. Will it work? Well, the advice appears to be if Mycoplasma bovis isn't eradicated now, it's here for good. Tonight on Checkpoint, the announcement itself, which was made less than an hour ago, reaction and the Minister of Agriculture and Biosecurity. Also tonight, DHBs almost double their pay offer to nurses can deal be done and therefore a strike averted. Dick Quacks, once the fastest man over 5,000 metres in the world, dies age 70 and a small craft brewery in Riwaka beats some global brewing giants.
RNZ News at five. Kia ora, good afternoon. Ko Katrina Bat in Aho. The government has announced it will try to eradicate Mycoplasma bovis from New Zealand farms. At the moment, 37 farms are confirmed as being infected and more than 11,000 cattle have been slaughtered. Another four farms have been treated and declared clear of the disease. The government estimates 152,000 cattle will have to be killed in total. It will be a phased eradication over the next one to two years and will cost about $886 million. The Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern says the longer the disease is left, the more difficult it becomes to eradicate. I do not want to look back on this time having seen the full impact of this disease on the productivity of our farming sector and the well-being of our rural communities and say, I wish we had tried harder. Jacinda Ardern. District health boards are confident a new pay deal will stop nurses striking. They've announced an offer of a 9% pay rise over 15 months for nurses represented by the union. DHBs have been in pay talks for months with nurses who say they're being overworked and underpaid. The pay offer is part of a $520 million package and includes a $2,000 one-off payment plus $48 million to increase staffing levels. The DHB's spokesperson, Helen Mason, says the offer is significantly higher than it, what it was last on the table. I'm really optimistic that it will mean no strike action. It's a long time since we've had a national strike. We've really strongly heard nurses' concerns. Helen Mason says DHB's will work alongside the nurses' union on sorting out pay equity. The bully of a South Auckland school says up to three students will likely be suspended after an assault put a teenager in hospital. The 16-year-old student from James Cook High School in Manurewa was taken to Middlemore Hospital after he was tripped up, punched once and hit his head on the ground. Jesse Chang reports. The school's principal, Grant McMillan, says an ambulance was called and a school nurse went with the injured student to the hospital. He says the student was responsive and talking when his family arrived. Mr McMillan says the school knows who the bullies are and he says they will be severely dealt with. He says he's disappointed with what happened, but it's the first falling out he knows of with this particular group of students. Cordesi Chang, TNA. The boy has now been discharged from hospital. A woman has died following a police pursuit on State Highway 56 just south of Palmerston North. The police say the chase began after a 15-year-old boy failed to stop for officers at 1.30 this afternoon. Katie Doyle reports. A spokesperson says the boy sped past officers on Monrad Street before travelling onto State Highway 56, where he crashed into a power pole at the intersection of Pioneer Highway and Sheriff's Road. A young woman who was sitting in the front seat died at the scene, while a second, who was in the back passenger side seat, has serious injuries. The driver was critically injured and is in Palmerston North Hospital. An internal investigation will get underway shortly, as well an investigation by the Serious Crash Unit. The Independent Police Conduct Authority will be notified and the road will remain closed with diversions in place. Katie Doyle, Aho. Thousands of secondary teachers and principals have been mulling proposals for a major overhaul of the NCEA school qualification. A ministerial advisory group has suggested changes including abolishing exams for level one of the NCEA and halving the number of credits students must pass in that first year of the qualification. The Our Education correspondent John Gerritsen reports. Teachers and principals spoken to by RNZ News say the NCEA definitely needs improvement, especially because of the high workload caused by internal assessment. Early reactions included a thumbs up for reducing the workload at level one and for raising literacy and numeracy requirements. But teachers were worried 20 credit projects proposed for all levels of the NCEA could be difficult to manage and mark. The discussion document says the projects could be involvement in a school production or research related to student studies. Court John Gerritsen, TNA. The county's Monaco DHB will extend hours in some departments in response to a staffing crisis at Middlemore Hospital. A letter to the Health Minister by Middlemore's Director of Medicine on behalf of 13 department heads describes a crisis in staffing, in particular causing a delay in cancer treatment and a lack of beds and facilities. The District Health Board's Acting Chief Executive, Gloria Johnson, says they're addressing staffing concerns, including using side rooms, extending cardiology lab hours and more allocated theatre time. 
Dr Johnson says the board is working with the Crown Monitor and Ministry of Health to deal with the crisis. It's five past five. Sport, the All Blacks training camps are receiving heavy criticism for pulling key players away from their Super Rugby franchises. The camps are designed as preparation for the June 3rd Test Match Series against France, which starts in Auckland in just under a fortnight. All Black Damien McKenzie says despite his side, the Chiefs losing to the Sharks in South Africa during the first camp last week, it's all about balance. You know, when we come in here, it's about our main focus is on the, what we need to do for the All Blacks. And then once we, we've finished our camps, we're back with our Super Franchise. We got a week off with the boys still being in South Africa, so it um, gets you a bit fresh for the, for the following game. Obviously, you never like losing, so um, obviously it was probably created a bit more edge for our, for our game we had in the weekend, um, which I thought we played reasonably well, actually. Damien McKenzie speaking from Christchurch as part of the All Blacks' second camp. The mainland tactics will be searching for a record-breaking fourth win of the season when they host the Northern Mystics in the ANZ Premiership tonight. The two sides met in round one with the tactics beating the Mystics 42-39. to It's unknown if Mystic star shooter Maria Falau will be named to join the Auckland side. The Cleveland Cavaliers have booked their spot in a fourth consecutive NBA final after beating the Boston Celtics 96-83, retaining the Eastern Conference title. They'll face the winner of the Western Conference final between the Golden State Warriors and the Houston Rockets, which will be determined tomorrow. That's the news. Nurses set to strike. We cover between about 93 and 97% of all staff, so it is very significant. Farmers to cull. They went through and took the calves off the property. It was pretty painful and close. If they're going to get on and do it properly and responsibly, really, uh, cull is their only option. And councillors cut off from receiving a controversial report. All elected members are equal in their democratic responsibilities and confidentiality shouldn't inhibit or harness their ability to see what's going on. Plenty of cut and thrust. Morning reports weekdays from 6. Then on 9 to noon, how artificial intelligence and robotics could revolutionise architecture and the construction industry. And after 10, the founder of Birds of Prey conservation group Wingspan, Debbie Stewart, on protecting New Zealand's raptor birds. Join me, Catherine Ryan, on 9 to noon after morning report on RNZ National. Met service weather through to midnight tomorrow, Northland to Taumaranui, also Coromandel Bay of Plenty in Taupo. Fine with morning frosts in sheltered places. Taranaki, Whanganui and Taihape to the Kapiti Coast. Scattered showers with snow above 700 metres easing by this evening and becoming confined to high ground tomorrow. Gisborne to Wairarapa and Wellington, showers some heavy with hail easing from the south this evening. Southerly gales about the coast easing tonight. Coast, coastal Marlborough and Canterbury, scattered showers with snow above 500 metres, clearing in the south and about the high country by this evening and becoming confined to Christchurch and Banks Peninsula tomorrow. Inland Marlborough, Nelson, Buller, Westland and Fiordland, fine with morning frosts. Otago and Southland, remaining coastal showers clearing by this evening, then fine and frosty. And the Chatham Islands showers with gale southerlies easing tonight. It's eight and a half past five and you're listening to Checkpoint. Thank you very much indeed Katrina Batten and thank you everyone for being with us. We begin tonight of course with the decision to attempt to eradicate Mycoplasma bovis. It will cost $886 million dollars or thereabouts. Katie Milne, the CEO of Federated Farmers, called it having a crack. Seated beside her in the centre of a group of agricultural representatives, the Prime Minister said, and I quote, we have one shot to eradicate and we are doing it together. The announcement was made in Wellington less than an hour ago. The devastating impact on the farms and farmers who will have their herds culled, like it or not, was offset against the national interest and the national herd. 20,000 dairy and beef farms across the country. Here's some of what the Prime Minister said. We essentially had three options in front of us today. Phased eradication, long-term management, or doing nothing. Our plan to eradicate Mycoplasma bovis over time will require significant resources from both government and the industry. But to not act would cost even more. Cabinet today agreed with a decision that was essentially indicated by industry last week on a phased eradication plan that all up could cost $886 million, paid for in partnership between government and industry. Of this, 
870 million is the cost of the response, including compensation, and there will be an estimated $16 million cost to the industry due to lost production as well. To not act at all is estimated to cost the industry $1.3 billion in lost production over a 10 year period with ongoing productivity losses across our farming sector. This does not include the unquantifiable cost of what allowing the disease to remain in New Zealand would have on the well-being of our rural communities. Jacinda Ardern speaking uh, about an hour ago. We will have more from the Prime Minister later in Checkpoint, $886 million. Now seated beside her and the seating plan did appear a pointed declaration that the government and federated farmers are of a like mind on this. Was Fed Farmers CEO Katie Milne? This is one of those times when you've got to take that call and have a crack. We're after looking after the whole of New Zealand's herd and unfortunately it means that there's less than 0.5 percent that are going to have to um, take the knock for the rest of us. We're going to wrap around some really good support around our farmers who are going to go through this. This is a tough time and the pain and anguish they're going to go through is, is really hideous and we have to support them as neighbours, as community members, farmers, friends and so on. And our focus is going to be co to continue on to make sure that they get that support and make sure that the system provides the compensation quickly and adequately and all those things to make this as easy a process as it can be, given it's such a difficult process. Katie Milne, you would have heard her saying the pain and anguish the farmers are going to go through is really hideous. Well, at a public meeting attended by 800 farmers in Cambridge on Friday, Waikato dairy farmer Hank Schmidt outed a herd he co-owns as the first in the region to have Mycoplasma bovis. Our reporter Zach Fleming and cameraman Nick Monroe have spent the day on one of Hank's uh, three farms. After six o'clock tonight, Hank tells Zach about the herd of cattle he purchased from Alfonsi Straten back in 2016 and what happened to that herd. But just after 4pm this afternoon, before he began milking, Zach broke the news of that decision to Hank. The government will try to eradicate the Mycoplasma bovis disease from New Zealand farms with the agreement of the farming sector. It will be a phased eradication planned over the next one to two years and will cost $886 million. And this will involve culling all cattle on all infected properties as well as cattle on any restricted properties. So that's both of your farms. Yes, it sounds like it, yeah. How, how are you feeling at the moment? Wow. I feel like I'm dropping in a hole at the moment. Yeah. Is it what you were expecting? Well, I, I thought I would have a bit more common sense. Yeah, I think uh, the farming community, farming community has got the uh, worst diseases to deal with, in my opinion. What does this mean for you now? The, if I can continue reading, it says that of that $886 million, $870 million will cover the response to farmers, including compensation. Will you keep farming? Oh, I mean, uh, if if I have to uh, give up my cows, if they come and take my cows, then uh, no, definitely I'll be out of farming, that's it. I've given 33 years of my life to this industry and uh, it's, it's quite hard to take, actually, just to see my family go. Yeah. Will you try and do anything to stop them coming and taking your cows? You said, you said it's an if, but, but this press release here says that they will be culling all cows on restricted and infected properties, which are, are both your farms. Oh, I don't know. I have to think about this. I mean, I, uh, I find it really hard to, uh, to see my good cows uh, go. Uh, the other thing is, so far, uh, I've got no reason uh, to, uh, to have faith uh, in the compensation process. I mean, the farmers that have been dealt with, uh, they're coming up severely short. And uh, I think from, uh, from the contacts uh, that I've had is uh, some farmers had the word from the bank already. Um, so, you know. This press release here says that Dairy New Zealand supports the decision to try and eradicate the disease. Are you surprised by that? Yes, I am. Yeah. 
I am. I thought I was a bit more common sense available in the, in the industry, uh, particularly when they don't know how how widespread it is. Um, no, I'm shocked actually. Are you, are you all right, Hank? I mean, are you, what are you going to do? I mean, <laughs> uh, I'm going to have a couple of Steve Rams tonight. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'll probably smoke an extra pack of smokes. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean. I think when you go through life, uh, you deal with problems and you uh, look for solutions and uh, and whatever, and that's that's how, how I go through life like everybody else. But this is uh, a problem that's out of my hands, you know. Somebody is taking uh, taking that power away from me to sort my problems, uh, and I find that very, very sad. I mean, you saw my calves this afternoon, you know. I put a lot of uh, effort and love uh, into rearing my calves, and now the call has been made: these animals are going to be killed, you know. I find it uh, shocking. It's not just money for you, is it? No, well, I need to pay my bills. Uh, but for the rest, nah. I mean, uh, I haven't gone through life worrying too much about money, you know. I love what I'm doing. And, and, uh, for some and now that's over. As you said, you're going to stop farming. Oh, I mean, if my cows go, that, that is it for me, you know. I'm not going to start all over again. And uh, nah. No, definitely not. Waikato dairy farmer Hank Schmidt uh, talking to our reporter Zach Fleming about an hour ago. We're joined now live on the phone from Wellington by Agriculture and Biosecurity Minister Damien O'Connor. Thanks for joining us, Minister. I know you're having a frantic afternoon. Can you tell Hank Schmidt why eradication is the right decision? Um, because, John, this is the only opportunity we've got to get rid of a disease that um, has um, severe impacts on many animals um, and is undermining, I guess, the viability of, of farmers around the world. Some of them are uh, subsidised, some of them have different farming systems, but uh, none of them operate in the same way that we do. And indications are that uh, this disease could have a severe impact on our farming operations, not only in the short term, but the long term. So there were three choices, according to the Prime Minister in the media conference, that you sat beside her at uh, just over an hour ago. Phased eradication, uh, long-term management and doing nothing effectively. Why was it choice number one that you went for, phased eradication? D d is there any evidence whatsoever that this can work? It will be unprecedented if it does, won't it? Yes, it is. Look, all the um, identified animals have come from one strain of Mycoplasma bovis. We believe that it's come from one incursion, one place. It's been a real struggle to track and trace these animals because our animal tracing system hasn't been what it should be. But we've been working through that systematically and still um, identified infected animals and herds off the back of those animal movements. Um, and so that that gives us um, a belief that we can identify all these potential uh, infected animals around the country over time and contain and have to cull them and then eradicate the disease. Minister, I guess the key phrase is over time. As we have all been learning, all the townies in the country have been learning, is that cattle, dairy cows move around an enormous amount. So as you're catching up, as MPI is trying to find out where the latest infection is, isn't it spreading? Uh, no, we believe, of course, it's, I can't say it might not be, but I'm saying that we have locked down every uh, infected and likely infected herd. There are many, um, 300 herds, in fact, um, that, that we've locked down. There's no movements going from those properties. Uh, not all are in, uh, positively identified as infected, so we're taking precautions. And, and while there may be uh, a trace that we haven't um, found yet, uh, we believe that we are getting on top of it and we've got to move forward. If we backed off this now, there's no hope of ever eradicating this disease. Uh, compensation has to be provided quickly and adequately, Katie Mills said. Uh, Katie Milne said, I I I have you been doing that so far? In other words, uh, you can do much better on that front, can't you? 
we can do much better on that front and we've made a commitment that those people who are facing their herds being culled will receive within 10 days you know, a good portion of their, of their compensation amount. Uh, the final amounts based on um, working through loss of income from milk and, and other subsidiary income uh, may, may take a little longer but we're committed to doing that. Look, we've, it's been a learning curve for MPI for everyone across the country and mistakes have been made. We could have done better. We, we're committed with the help of industry bodies and more people on the ground to help the farmers make the compensation um, claims, fill them in, get them in and we'll turn them around in a hurry to ensure that farmers aren't unfairly put under financial pressure. Uh, healthy cattle will be culled, won't they? If they are, uh, the prima facie evidence is that they have been exposed or potentially exposed. Yes, John, and, and I think the, the papers identify that over 10 years we could eradicate up to 126,000 animals, which is a lot of animals. But you have to keep in mind the fact that um, there's, there's about a million cows killed every year from the dairy industry in the normal part of farming practice. And so over, you know, 10 years, um, you know, that, that's a relatively small amount. Um, you know, some are saying around less than 1% of the farms affected in, in an attempt to try and protect uh, the long-term incomes and viability of over 20,000 farms and farmers and their families throughout the country. Let's talk about Heng as an example, the universal in the particular. So he gets these cows from uh, Alphonse Stratton. So they start in South and they end up in Waikato. They have also some of the uh, stock, some of the herd has been grazing in Kaitaia. Does that mean that you are fairly certain now, for example, tracing the movement of all the cattle that have come out of or have been connected to this farm in Southland, that there will be mycoplasma bovis in the north, for example? Well, we are investigating um, those farms and the leads um, from uh, Hink's farm. Absolutely, we are investigating all those properties and testing to see if any animals are infected. And, and if that is confirmed, then we we follow on from the tracing. Yes, the, this is quite a technical and challenging task, but it's one that's not impossible and we believe it's worth the effort. Okay. What's responsible for this infection? How did it come into the country? Do you know that yet? Not absolutely, no. We are investigating it. Uh, MPI have a team doing that. Um, there are a lot of uh, potentially low-risk uh, pathways, uh, semen, embryos, um, dirty equipment, all of those things. Um, we're hoping that no one blatantly brought this into the country or knowingly did so, but we've got to nail uh, the pathway so that we can try and prevent it happening did in you the say, future. Yeah, absolutely. Did you say dirty equipment is a possibility? Look, that could be, you know, we've got... Should we've got, farmers um, be importing dirty equipment into New Zealand? Absolutely not. Absolutely so so, not. so and, if and dirty equipment is responsible, would you potentially, and I know we're dealing with hypotheticals here, but are there prosecutions that may follow? Yes, there would be. If, if that can be proven. And believe me, um, you know, I share the concern of all the farming community and the wider um, uh, community as well that we shouldn't have people who, who break the law and, and, and the results of uh, uh, something like this, which is, you know, catastrophic, catastrophic for some farming families. Um, but that's a separate process. What we've got to do is try and get ahead of this disease so we can contain and then eradicate it. You are absolutely convinced this is the right decision and you're absolutely convinced there is a realistic chance of eradicating Mycoplasma bovis and I guess the question I would like to attach to that is, is MPI up to this task? Um, MPI has been challenged all the way through this process. It's brand new for them. It's brand new for vets, for Assure Quality, for everyone involved. We've never had to take on a task like this before, and I'm sure mistakes have been made, but we're ramping up. We've given you know, $100 million since we've been in government to this effort. Um, we're getting more people on the ground. The industry organisations are stepping up with individuals. Um, I think we're doing OK. We could... You know, always do better and we will do better as we learn along this pathway.
Damien O'Connor, uh, O'Connor, the minister who was uh, at that announcement and very much part of the decision-making process, joining us live. We will have more on Microplace for Bobus and the decision to eradicate later in the programme. Let's go to another very big story today. Thousands of experienced nurses could get pay rises of up to 16% under a new package being offered by district health boards. DHBs have today revealed a package worth more than half a billion dollars in a bid to avert nationwide strikes this winter. But as Nita Blake Person reports, it may not be enough to stop nurses walking off the job. Nurses who say they're overworked and underpaid have been in pay talks with their employers for months. DHBs have today adopted many of the recommendations made by an independent panel working on the dispute. They include an immediate 3% across the board pay increase, another 3% in August and a final 3% next August. That's as well as a $2,000 one-off payment and a 2% boost to nursing numbers. But DHB spokeswoman Helen Mason says for registered nurses with more than five years experience, who number around 15,000, the offer goes further. Over the term of the agreement they would be on a salary of 93,000, which is a significant difference to what they would be on today, the average RN or midwife. Um, currently they'd be on a salary of in the range of 81,000, so you can see that that increase from 81 to 93 is really substantial. Helen Mason says the latest offer virtually doubles the previous package rejected by nurses in March, which included a series of 2% pay increases. It's a pretty tough environment working in health, and we've got an increasing population with increasingly unwell people who we're caring for, which means that we actually need really great skilled nurses. And what this offer does, it recognises the skill and the experience of our nurses um, and rewards that. The Nurses' Union isn't commenting on the latest offer. It says it was surprised to hear it had been published by DHBs this afternoon and will be analysing it before presenting it to their members on Thursday. But Auckland nurse Danny Wilkinson says it's not as positive as the DHBs are making out. It still has us well below inflation. It has us still well below what teachers are earning. So I don't think it's great. Um, I think the only good thing in the... Um, offer that's come through is the two extra steps to the pay scale. So instead of capping out at five years, you cap out at seven years. So that's a good positive step. Danny Wilkinson says the pay rates still aren't enough to attract and retain new staff. Our lowest paid nurses are still going to be earning a good um, 8% less than the lowest paid nurses in Australia. And we're going to keep losing nurses unless that's caught up. Ms Wilkinson believes strike action should still go ahead. Scott Boys, who's an emergency department doctor at Hawke's Bay Hospital, says nationwide strikes would have a big impact on frontline services, but there's widespread support for nurses' plight. They step into the breach. We've got problems. They are so passionate about the job that they do. They get involved. You know, they're pushing the beds around. They're making it work. They're dealing with the public. They do a fantastic job in the emergency department. And with the overcrowding and the acute demand uh, increases, you know, they really feel the brunt of those. So I think this is important to highlight the problems that they have with their um, work conditions. Nurses will be consulted over the coming weeks before voting on whether to go ahead with the strikes on the 5th and 12th of July. Mō te hōtaka o te atanei, ko Nita Blake person aho. A teenager has been taken to hospital in a serious condition after a bullying incident at an Auckland high school. The 16-year-old, sorry, the 16-year-old James Cook High School student was taken to Middlemore Hospital after he was tripped up, punched once and hit his head on the ground. The school's principal, Grant McMillan, spoke to reporters this afternoon about what happened. Sadly this morning at Interval, um, we had a bullying incident with one student as a victim, two, possibly three other students involved. We know who they are. Um, there were duty staff around at the time, so the, the student who was bullied um, was foot tripped and then punched once. During that he fell to the ground and it was a sealed area um, and he hit his head. Our duty staff were on site moments later and our senior students prefects also stepped in to help as well. The duty staff, um, as did our nursing staff, followed immediate protocol for a suspected head injury. We ring an ambulance immediately. Um, I think we end up making two phone calls, we've got two ambulances arriving. So that's okay. The um, situation, the student was taken to a nursing area, um, met with ambulance staff and then straight through to Middlemore. Um, one of our school nurses travelled with the student and she didn't leave until family others were there. As she left, he was set up in bed smiling and chatting. So that's great news. Um, the students who have broken our expectations, um, we've got a very, very simple um, response. Serious bullying involves police because actually we're trying to grow fine young citizens here. Um, police have been extraordinarily helpful. Um, they arrive very quickly and um, they're working through their processes right now. 
but um, and my assurance to both our students and the school assembly we've just held and also to our parents and that will be going out later on this afternoon is that those students who caused this will be held fully responsible within our school's discipline system. What, are, what could the repercussions be? Um, most likely suspended from school and then brought for the Board of Trustees for them to decide on what conditions, if at all, the students return to our school. Is this the first time that these particular students have been It's the first falling out we've known amongst this lot. Um, we've got to go back and do our work on that now. So it, I've told you what I know, what I think is that this is probably some falling out stuff over the weekend. I don't know that yet, but we've still got to do our work on that. Um, there doesn't appear to be a pattern or anything in here, but we don't know enough about that yet. Are they in the same uh, year group or the same year uh, group? Three of them are in the same year group. Um, I probably have socialised together in the past. Um, in terms of bullying, we know that um, it can be a problem among, um, among young people generally. Is it a problem in your school? Um, it's a problem if it ever happens, ever. So as of today, it's a problem in our school. Um, we serve our students regularly. We get really good data about how safe they feel and the likes but we also spent the last seven weeks leading up to the, um, the pink shirt day last week and that was a major focus trying to make our school a better place to be. So I'm more than confident the vast majority of our students understand that. The vast majority of our students want our school to be a good and safe place to be and want to be a part of a school they can be proud of but from time to time these things happen. Sadly it's happened and I'm not happy about that, far from it, but we will deal with it as it happens. That's Grant McMillan, the principal of James Cook High School, speaking earlier this afternoon. The teenager has now been discharged from hospital. You're with Checkpoint on RNZ. Thank you for being with us. Sir Peter Snell is coming up to pay tribute to Dick Quacks, who passed away today at the age of 70. Several homeowners north of Kaikoura say they've been stuck in limbo for 18 months since an earthquake devastated the area and a small craft brewery in Liwaka beats some global brewing giants. Plus, of course, businesses with Nona and more on Mycoplasma bovis and the attempted eradication. But before it all, Katrina with the headlines. The government says it will try to eradicate the cattle disease Mycoplasma bovis from farms, with the Prime Minister saying we have one shot to eradicate and we are doing it together. It's estimated 152,000 cattle in total will have to be killed over the next one to two years at a cost of about $886 million. The Federated Farmers CEO, Katie Milne, has told Checkpoint it's necessary to look after the whole of New Zealand's herd. She's called on all farmers to support those worst affected and who'll be going through hideous pain and anguish. District health boards have offered a 9% pay rise over 15 months as part of a pay deal they believe will prevent a nurses' strike. Some senior nurses could get increases of up to 16%. The pay offer is part of a $520 million package and includes $48 million to provide more staff. DHBs have been in pay talks for months with nurses who say they're being overworked and underpaid. The Nurses' Union earlier said its members want immediate increases of at least 11% to avert strike action this winter. The county's Monaco DHB will extend hours in some departments at Middlemore Hospital. It comes after 13 department heads wrote to the Minister of Health over a crisis in staffing, which was causing delays in cancer treatment at the hospital. The DHB says they're using side rooms, extending cardiology lab hours and allocating more theatre time. A woman has died and two young people have been injured after a police a pursuit on State Highway 56 just south of Palmerston North. The police say the chase began after a 15-year-old boy failed to stop for officers this afternoon, then crashed into a power pole. A young woman sitting in the front seat died at the scene. Another woman has serious injuries and the driver was critically injured. A Manuera school principal says students involved in an assault which put a teenager in hospital will probably be suspended. The 16-year-old from James Cook High School was taken to Middlemore Hospital after he fell, hitting his head as a result of being tripped up and punched. He's now being discharged. Those are the headlines. I'm back at six. Thank you very much indeed, Katrina. Nona Peltier on the other side of me. Hi, Nona. Uh, medical appliance manufacturer Fisher and Paykel Healthcare made record profit and sales. That's right. Yes, they're doing very 
very well. Uh, their products uh, to hospitals, for example, they, they sell face, face masks and humidifiers and other kinds of things to help with breathing, say sleep apnea, that kind of stuff. And anyway, uh, yeah, they've done very well. They made a record profit of um, $119 million, which is pretty uh, hefty. And uh, their revenue was up 10% to $980.8 million. They're expecting another good year ahead, mostly in the hospital, less so in the home uh, care products, that's for sleep apnea. There's a lot of competition now in their space, so they're looking at uh, some product innovation and the release of a mask, a new mask, a new equipment later this year, but they were not specific enough, and I guess that's one of the reasons why their share price was down about one and a quarter percent today. So even though they had the stellar result, the yeah. market wasn't that happy because a little uncertainty, not too sure about yeah. that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the Cooperative Bank has posted a small rise in its net profit, which will allow it to pay out more than two million in rebates to its customers. Yeah. What, what's all this about? Well, they, this is a this used to be the Public Service Investment Society. Right. Right. Okay, and they share their profits with members. So even though they made a small increase in profits, so they went up one point three percent to ten and a half million. They actually share that up with their customers or clients, as the case may be, or shareholders, I guess maybe yep, yep. to some extent. One hundred and fifteen thousand of them, and they added fourteen thousand new ones in the just the past Last year, so they're going to share in that two million dollars in rebates. Uh, yes, yeah, so ten and a half million dollars to the year to March, and yeah. So overall, our market was up seven points, which isn't too bad. Eight thousand six hundred and forty-five, and our dollar is buying sixty-nine point five US, ninety-one point seven Australian, and. 52.1 pence. Hovering around 69, isn't it, against the U.S.? Yeah, it's pretty good. And yeah. I think it's also because there's some changes there. And we'll see how it goes with oil is actually uh, one of the issues that's uh, arising. Mostly it's uh, likely to fall. So, Nona Peltier, thank you very much indeed. Quick business news tonight because we've got a lot in the program. Uh, time is coming up to 24 minutes to six. Dick Quacks, who won a silver medal at the Montreal Olympics in 1976 and broke the world record in the 5,000 metres the following year, has died in Auckland, aged 70. A local body politician for much of the period since the year 2000. It's what he did on the track decades prior to that that put him amongst a celebrated group of New Zealand middle distance runners. At his best, and in 1977, he became the fastest man over five kilometres in recorded human history. Dick Quacks was a singularly driven athlete. They weren't his best events, but he ran a mile in under four minutes, the 1500 and 336 in a marathon in two hours 11. But it was in the 5000 that Dick Quacks was at or near the top of his field for years in the 1970s, earning the admiration of many including triple Olympic gold medalist Sir Peter Snell. He was clearly an outstanding runner. He was trained under the Lydiard model with, uh, by John Davies. Uh, he was a, a neighbour of mine for a time in uh, Mount Albert uh, in Auckland. He actually lived directly across the street from, uh, from me, so I saw a bit of him, and then later on when... Uh, uh, I was at uh, university in uh, Washington State. Uh, he was uh, working at Athletics West in uh, uh, Oregon. Um, but he's, uh, I mean, there are not many people can boast uh, what he has, a world record mm. at 5,000 metres. Um, Murray came close to doing that. Um, of course, Murray was a gold medalist at 5,000 metres, but uh, Dick came pretty darn close to doing yes, that as did. well. It was just so disappointing that uh, that he got tipped by Lassie Viren. And, you know, uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was really heartbreaking. He and Rod uh, uh, at Montreal, it's so vividly in my mind still. Um, but, but, uh, but Dick was a, uh, a fun guy to uh, be around, good sense of humour. And uh, you know, he obviously you know, had a had a good brain. He was, uh, um, you know, a smart guy. Mm. Can we talk about that world record in '77? Th th that was a magic time in the history of the 5,000, wasn't it? Oh. Th there was intense competition. Yes. And, and, yeah, yeah, and I think we can. Yeah. So, so, so Dick really is an important part, I think, of. Uh, of New Zealand's heritage is, is uh, a, I mean, we're, we're the best, uh, certainly uh, per capita of any nation around in, uh, in middle distance and distance running. 
uh, maybe maybe Kenya is overtaking us now, but um, uh, but uh, we we certainly had an amazing run with Walker Dixon cracks, and then a little bit earlier Murray, Barry McGee, John Davies, Bill Bailey, myself, and a host of others, and it was a it was a wonderful time. What was it that 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 made you men? I mean, you talked about the Lydiard uh, you, training. Yes, it, but, it, but, was, but you, it was very successful. Yeah, but you were self-made too, weren't you? You were singular characters. You know, as I, you know, when I, I, I when I think about it, the, you know, the amount of time we spent, um, sort of getting to that level was was kind of amazing, and you so, know, in some ways we. We sacrificed other aspects of our life in order to be able to do it. Um, but, uh, you know, people uh, that high achievers uh, uh, are prepared to do that um, and, uh, and sort of pay this price of, uh, you know, minimizing your social life. I mean, the training was sort of like, uh, you know, all, all, all I remember doing was just uh, working uh, during the day, uh, doing my training and then going to sleep and that was it got pretty boring <laughs> after a while but <laughs> driven by uh, as as dick was uh, you know the knowing that this is what you had to do to uh, to get the results you got the golds and dick got the silver and boy that's everything in competition isn't it and he often reflected on that 5000 at montreal where he was just right. pipped by lassie at the end brutal really in terms of the difference he felt it made to his life yes uh, it, it, it's it, it's amazing really i mean i uh, dick's life might have been oh, not hugely so but i i think if he had Won that gold medal. That, that along with his five thousand, that would have propelled him, I think, uh, uh, to a top echelon. And it was so close. Mm. I mean, he isn't the top echelon anyway. There's no question about that at all. But it's just a shame he uh, he was so close to uh, to uh, getting that gold in Montreal. Mm. Uh, yep, yeah, I'm really sad about yeah. Dick. Uh, I think. You know, he, he has been an important legacy, uh, a part of the uh, New Zealand's legacy in middle distance and distance running, that's for sure. Sir Peter Snell, reflecting on Dick Quacks, who died today, age 70. It's 18 minutes to six. Part-time work and job placements could be worth NCEA credits and a proposed major overhaul of the secondary school qualification. A ministerial advisory group charged with reviewing NCEA has suggested changes including abolishing level one exams and halving the number of credits students must pass in that first year of the qualification. It also calls for, called for the introduction of major projects at all three levels of the qualification. NCEA has our education correspondent, John Gerritsen. The proposals are called Big Ideas and they're aimed at reducing the workload associated with NCEA, making it more relevant and ensuring students and teachers are focused on real learning, not just accumulating credits. They include dropping the $77 per student fee for exams and raising literacy and numeracy standards. English teacher Natalie Faitala doesn't think the NCEA is working well and says changes are needed. I like the focus on less assessment. I think we definitely overassess our, our students and they're doing far too much assessment and not enough just learning. I like uh, getting rid of the cost of exams because I think sometimes that is a bit of a barrier for some students. But she's not sure about abolishing external exams at Level 1. I am not so sure that having no exams is going to be positive at Level 1, but it may be, it may be fine. You know, it's always good to practice something to prepare yourself for the next year. And that's kind of what Level 1 is at the moment, is a foundation. Maths teacher Jake Wills particularly likes the plans for Level 1. The changes around Level 1 are the most interesting to me. The big focus there on the literacy and numeracy is going to hopefully lead to some really good outcomes for the kids because often we're very good at getting our kids through the literacy and numeracy credits, but often that is at the detriment of them actually having literacy and numeracy skills.
The advisory group has also suggested giving students up to 20 credits for work placements or internships. Jake Wills says that's similar to what schools are already doing. We have a number of students at the moment who spend three days a week at school and two days a week on a trades course. Those trades courses generally are able to get them up to about 40 credits throughout the year. And so I kind of just see it as an extension of that. And for a lot of our students, that is well and truly the best pathway for them to be going down. Jack Boyle from the Post-Primary Teachers Association says many teachers will be looking at how the proposals might reduce their workloads and those of their students. Couched in that sort of frame, the proposal to reduce the number of credits at NCA Level 1 is something that there's pretty solid acknowledgement as being a good idea to talk about. The stuff around the project-based approaches instead, that's the one where there's a, there's a few more question marks from secondary teachers at this stage. Jack Boyle says the projects, which might be worth 20 credits at each level of the NCEA, could be difficult to manage a mark. Phil Holstein from Burnside High School in Christchurch says the proposals are aimed at improving the NCEA and addressing important issues such as equity and student wellbeing. The NCEA qualification and framework is a good one, but the unintended outcomes since it's introduced is something that we need to address now. So this is timely that we're doing it, and I'm really pleased that we are. Phil Holstein says the six big ideas need to be viewed as a single package rather than taken in isolation. Public consultation on NCA changes ends in the middle of September. The Education Minister Chris Hipkins will report back to Cabinet in February next year with the consultation findings and recommendations for updating the qualification. Mo te o te ahi ahi, ko John Gerritsen tēnei. Several homeowners in Rakotara, north of Kaikoura, have been stuck in limbo for 18 months since an earthquake devastated the area. While much of the damage in the township is being repaired, five homeowners have been barred from repairing and occupying their properties due to an unstable cliff nearby. They say they now have no idea what to do and blame the council and the government for abandoning them. Uh, Logan Church reports from Rakatara. Nestled along the newly reopened State's Highway 1, the small settlement of Rakotara stands proudly between the sea and one of the cliffs that dominates Kaikoura's coastline. But for Nolene and John O'Carroll, that cliff has caused nothing but nightmares since a 7.8 magnitude earthquake rocked the area in November 2016. We thought the house was going to go down the hill, which is not that much, but it seemed like it at the time. Horrific shaking, almost incredible. We just waited, rolled up ourselves in our blankets in the bed and thought, well, if we're going to die, we might as well be warm. <laughs> After surviving a barrage of large boulders that came down the cliff and pummeled their house during the quake, Nolene and John hoped to fix their home and to move back in. They were paid $21,000 by EQC for the land damage and received $70,000 from their private insurer to fix the house. But those plans ground to a halt as the council slapped their home with a 124 notice. The insurance company has paid us out a repair cost to get it repaired. EQC have paid us out for land damage. Now it's been, it's um, got a 124 notice on it which is unable to occupy because of rockfall. So we're in a, in a spot. We can't move forward. We have to wait. We've been waiting nearly two years, November. In the year or so since the quake, the house, built by John himself more than two decades ago, has decayed. Mowen lawns, once bordered by pristine gardens, are now a jungle. Plants are growing through their deck and outdoor furniture, and cobwebs engulf the veranda. The couple has since moved to Christchurch, and Nolan says she's had enough. She wants this house red zoned and gone. It's been terrible, it's taken a toll on John. I'm sorry. Considering that we both thought we were going to die. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then we're coming back to Christchurch and every noise, every bang, it, it really did send us both up into a, a space we don't like too much. <laughs> um, John especially, nerves, it just, it's just stress, just stress, we don't need it. Two doors down, Olivia Jarvis and Bo Broadhurst are in the same boat with their beachside batch. RNZ understands there are five properties in Rakotara in this situation. 
They can't occupy it and also have a $350,000 mortgage they still have to pay. Obviously we're still paying a, a mortgage on the property, so since the earthquake in November 2016, um, the council sort of said that we're not, not allowed back at the place, so therefore we can't really use the property or rent it out, so we're sort of in limbo with that, so yeah. They say an engineer's report highlights multiple natural hazards from the cliff, and they also want the land red zoned. We're just a big waiting game now, really. That's the question. It's been a year and a half now, and you know, people can't be expected to fork out money for something that they can't personally use or rent out to people in the community, so I don't know what we're supposed to do, really. Both Nolan and John, and Olivia and Bo, say they have had little help from the Kaikoura District Council, EQC, or Civil Defence. A government spokesperson says it's providing $5.3 million in this year's budget to help Kaikoura's recovery, and part of that will go towards solving issues with natural hazards. A spokesperson for the Kaikoura District Council says it doesn't have the financial resources to help all affected property owners, and the council has no intention to create a red zone. They say more work is required before any decisions regarding the extra central government funding can be made. So for these homeowners, it's now a nervous wait, in the hope that someone, anyone, will come to their rescue. From Rakotara for Checkpoint, Logan Church. We turn now to Eliza McCartney, who on Sunday morning New Zealand time pole vaulted higher than any woman from New Zealand or Australia has ever officially done before, 4.85 metres, the equal highest vault at a Diamond League event in Oregon, USA. On a countback, the Aucklander came second to former Olympic gold medalist American Jennifer Sur. But Jens Hur is 36 and Eliza McCartney is 21 and there's real excitement about her potential to go higher and higher. Although it's not just height, she's been getting high but also hitting the bar on the way down and a pole vaulter has to get up and across. And in Oregon, Eliza McCartney knew she'd done exactly that. You know when you hit a jump really well, I think, and um, I think part of competing a lot is you get a um, good understanding of bar awareness and where the bar is and so... I think when you really know is when you're going over it and you've already pushed off the pole and so it's only you going over the, um, over the bar and you, you kind of know then if it's going to stay or not. So that gives you plenty of time while you're falling down to celebrate. And, and, and tell me about that fall when you've cleared a PB, a national record, an Oceania record. What, what, what is that wonderful second like? <laughs> Oh, it's just incredible because it's just, it's just such raw emotion, you know. It, I think sport really brings it out in anybody. It just is the raw emotion. And I think, like, watching the video, I, on the way down, I think I, like, um, really celebrated it. When I hit the mess, I just kind of, <laughs> I kind of sat there. <laughs> just, I couldn't believe that I've finally cleared it because I've been looking at these heights for so long now that it feels like it's been so long. So... It was, it's almost like a little bit of a relief that I've finally nailed it in competition when, when I need to. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, because th this did feel like it was coming, didn't it? You knew it was coming, and I think everyone who watches you knew you were entirely capable of doing this height and touch wood higher. Well, yes. I mean, a lot of my jumps, I get a really big clearance over them, but I'm not always um, exactly over the bar, so I often get a big clearance when I come straight down onto the bar. Um, and I've done that so many times recently. I did that at the Commonwealth Games a lot, and so I was a little bit disappointed with jumping how I jumped there because it just, I knew I had the height, I just wasn't getting it in the right spot. So this is the first competition I've done in a while where I've actually got that right, and um, even though I was really tired by that point, I, was, I still had... Are still able to keep jumping at a high level like that, so that was also another good thing as well. Yeah, I, I want to talk about the tiredness because you'd flown there, you'd banged your elbow, you'd you spiked yourself, and so uh, <laughs> I mean, this is pretty tough physical stuff, isn't it? <laughs> it was a brutal <laughs> really. I mean, I was bleeding and I had bruises, and I've been dealing with um, a couple of training niggles anyway that are. Um, just annoying more than anything. So, you know, it was a little bit brutal. And um, it was actually really um, good to be able to compete off a 12 hour flight like that because yeah. I haven't really done that before. And so that's um, so good to know that I, it doesn't affect me um, too much. Like, I'm still able to compete to my best, which is um, really good. Um, and I did actually feel like my legs were a little bit heavy and a little bit tired. But um, I think it goes to show that 
the little things that are against you, they don't really matter in the end. You just have to push through them. Yes, because there is so much travel ahead of you this season. So it is fantastic to have that message so loud and clear that you can travel and compete in a pretty tight time frame. You wouldn't want to do it all the time, would you? But you've proven you can. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the the next, the, well, the rest of the season is going to be in Europe, and obviously that's um, a lot longer journey, but um, I'll be in Europe for at least three weeks before my first competition. So <laughs> that gives me plenty of yeah, time to nice. adjust and get into the time zone and get some training done. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that now. I've got um, quite a few competitions lined up, and hopefully I'll be doing them all. I mean, last year I had to pull out of most of them um, due to injury. So if I can just get all of these competitions under my belt already, that will just be huge because the more competitions I do, the, the better I'm going to be in competition. Um, I mean, I've, I still haven't done that many diving leagues, um, so I still feel like I'm learning a lot in mm, that regard mm. and, and how to travel and be on the circuit. So, yeah, it's, I mean, I'm still, I, I still feel quite young and inexperienced in a lot of these competitions, so they're, everyone's great confidence booster. Yeah. But the wonderful thing about being young and inexperienced, and, of course, you're being modest there because you're gaining experience at a rate of knots, but... You still, you still ooze hope and possibility, and that's a fantastic position to approach competition from, isn't it? Oh, exactly. Yeah, it's, that's a really exciting thing. Is that even though I'm jumping high now, it's obvious that there's still more there. Yeah, <laughs> it's really, really, an amazing place to be. You know, yeah. I know I haven't maxed out. I know I've got years ahead of me, and that I think that's the that's just the best thing I could hope for, really. So I've got. Um, the whole season ahead of me and I've got a lot of time to go back to a longer run up now and um, try and push boundaries in that regard and hopefully get on much bigger poles so I can jump even higher so it's there's so many things to keep working on which is just the most exciting thing of all. Eliza McCartney. A small craft brewery in Rewaka has seized one of the top prizes in a beer competition, beating out big names like Steinlager and Heineken. A lager made by the Hop Federation Brewery was today named overall champion lager in New World's Beer and Cider Awards. Now, Hop Federation is run by Nikki and Simon Nicholas, who left Auckland five years ago to move to the heart of New Zealand's hop country. Here's our Nelson reporter, Tracy Neal. The week's brewing is done. So there's time for a tour of the small brewery on Main Road Rewalker, a lush green river valley in the lee of the Takaka Hill. So this is where we uh, do all our fermentation and also our bottling. So it, it's a pretty small brewery. We've packed quite a bit into the place. So we've got our... Simon Nicholas says when they bought the Rewaka Brewery, once known as Monkey Wizard, and turned it into Hop Federation, they knew little about the area, except for one thing. You just can't get these flavours anywhere else. Some of the vines that were brought over in the 1970s from America, you know, they were planted here, but now, so many years later, they're completely different. They've kind of changed to what New Zealand is. So, um, yeah, we've got an absolutely stunning piece of the world that we can grow these unique hops in. And which are used to make award-winning lager. To be uh, recognised as the uh, champion lager, I think there was something like 52 or 54 uh, lagers that were um, entered. Um, so for us, uh, you know, to have won, um, I'm quite excited and I think it's a, a pretty big deal for us. Hops were first planted in Nelson in 1842 by German and English settlers and now cover just over 530 hectares. The head of the National Grower Cooperative New Zealand Hops, Doug Donnellan, says the crops thrived in the region's frosty winters and warm summer rains. A lot of beer at that point would have been being made in the home, especially for the German settlers, and from that point on, I guess, Nelson also became quite a, a centre of brewing as well. There were several breweries in this region. Mr Donnellan says there's another reason that Nelson, Tasman is the ideal location for growing hops on a commercial scale. The region sits at precisely the right latitude, 41 degrees south, along with parts of Australia, South America and South Africa. Plants have now been developed to grow at this latitude. It's about the day length, so they need those longer days to develop and they then need the shorter days to come into maturity. Hop Federation brews about 150,000 litres of beer a year, including ales, pilsner and stout. The champion lager was made with Motueka and Nelson Sylvan hops, and Simon Nicholas's expertise gained as the head brewer at Auckland's Halito Brewery. 
but it goes back further than that. And also my dad's uh, quite an avid home brewer and he'd been doing it for years and years. Um, so I got stuck into that and um, then uh, when Nicky and I uh, moved out to um, Kumu um, in Auckland, um, Halatau was my local. So I was down there a lot. This year's hops harvest yielded 722 tonnes from 23 growers in the co-op. That's 38 fewer tonnes than last year, which Mr Donnellan says was linked to a wet spring. He says the industry dodged a bullet with two large storms which hit late in the harvest that caused widespread damage across Nelson and Tasman. Mr Nicholas says the impact is more likely to be felt next season. I'd say that we won't have enough particular hops. And that's just having to, um, I guess, adjust recipes and change it up and um, try and get a few other varieties that can uh, match or blend them. For Simon and Nicky, the risk they took moving south is now starting to pay off for the young family who are enjoying small town life and collecting awards along the way. In Rewaka for Checkpoint, Tracy Neal. Thank you, Tracy. It's coming up to six o'clock. After six, we're going to go back to the big story of the day, or well, one of the big stories of the day, which is the attempt to eradicate Mycoplasma bovis. RNZ News at six. Kia ora, good evening. Ko Katrina Batten, Tene. The government will cull more than 150,000 cattle and spend about a quarter of a billion dollars in an effort to eradicate Mycoplasma bovis from New Zealand farms. At the moment, 37 farms are confirmed as being infected and more than 11,000 cattle have been slaughtered. Another four farms have been treated and clear, declared clear of the disease. Here's our political editor, Jane Patterson. The phased eradication will take place over the next one to two years and will cost about $886 million. It will involve culling all cattle on all infected properties as well as cattle on any restricted properties. Farms will be disinfected then will lie fallow for 60 days after which stock can return. Of the $886 million, $16 million will be from loss of production and will be borne by farmers. $870 million covers was the cost of the response, including compensation to farmers. Farming groups say this will be devastating for affected farmers who are taking the hit for the rest of the industry. From Parliament, Jane Patterson. And the Waikato farmer, Hank Smith, whose herd has the virus, told Checkpoint the decision will be the end of his farming career. I feel like I'm dropping in a hole at the moment. If I have to... Uh give up my cows, if they come and take my cows then uh, no, definitely I'll be out of farming, that's it. I've given 33 years of my life to this industry and uh, it's quite hard to take actually. Waikato farmer Hank Smith. DHBs have upped their latest offer to nurses by a quarter of a billion dollars. Today's district health boards announced a new pay deal they expect will stop nurses striking. Boards have been in pay talks for months with the healthcare workers who say they're being overworked and underpaid. Under the new agreement, those in the union will get a 9% pay rise over 15 months. The DHB spokesperson Helen Mason says the new offer is worth over a half a billion dollars in the term of the agreement. The difference between this offer and the last offer which DHB has made, it's an increase of round about 250 million, so a quarter billion more funding has been put on the table for this offer to our nurses. Board spokesperson Helen Mason. Today's offer will be put to nurses later this week who will then vote on whether to go ahead with strikes in July. A Palmerston North business owner says the teenage driver of a car that crashed during a police pursuit killing himself and a 12-year-old girl was well above the speed limit. The pursuit along State Highway 56 ended when the 15-year-old driver slammed the car into a power pole. The girl who was in the front seat died at the scene and the critically injured driver died in hospital. Another passenger is in a serious condition. A local business owner says the teenager was going at an excessive speed down the busy road. What brought my attention was that it was just a completely different noise and um, so it just made me, you know, react and turn around. And that's when I seen the car come sliding across the road and hit the, hit the power pole and yes, it was going very, very quick. The Palmerston North business owner was one of the first people on the scene, which he says was deeply traumatic. 
The principal of a South Auckland school says he's assured students and parents that those responsible for an assault that put a teenager in hospital will be held accountable. A 16-year-old student from James Cook High School in Manurewa was taken to Middlemore Hospital after he was tripped up, punched once and hit his head on the ground. The principal, Grant McMillan, says an ambulance was called and a school nurse went with the injured student. He says the school knows who the other teenagers are and they'll be severely dealt with. The students who have broken our expectations, we've got a very, very simple um, response. Serious bullying involves police, because actually we're trying to grow fine young citizens here. Grant McMillan says they'll likely be suspended and go before the Board of Trustees. The boy has now been discharged. The county's Monaco DHB will extend hours in some departments as part of its response to a staffing crisis at Middlemore Hospital. A letter written by the Director of Medicine on behalf of 13 department heads detailed many problems in hospital departments. Katie Scotcher reports. The letter describes a crisis in staffing, in particular causing a delay in cancer treatment and a lack of beds and facilities. It was presented to the Minister during his visit to Middlemore Hospital in early March. County's Monaco Health's Acting Chief Executive, Dr Gloria Johnson, says they are addressing staff concerns. This includes using side rooms, extending cardiology lab hours and more allocated theatre time. Dr Johnson says the board is working with the Crown Monitor and Ministry of Health. Call Katie Scotcher Tene. Australia's opposition Labour Party has deferred a motion to close offshore detention centres for asylum seekers if it forms a government. The motion, drafted by Labour's left, proposed that it would close the detention centres in Papua New Guinea and Nauru within 90 days. It also proposed to bring all of the people who are refugees or seeking asylum remaining on Nauru or PNG's Manus Island to Australia. Shortly before the motion was to be debated at Labour's Victorian conference, two prominent unions within the party combined to defer it to the frustration of the audience. It's five and a half past six. Sport, the man who broke Dick Quax's long-standing 500-metre national record, says the New Zealand running legend was one of the first to congratulate him on the feat. Quax died aged 70 yesterday, leaving a legacy which includes a silver medal at the 1976 Olympics and a world 500-metre record the following year. Adrian Blinko finally broke what was also a national record in Belgium in 2008 and he remembers vividly a kind message from Quax following soon after. One of the first texts that I received was from an unknown number in New Zealand and it was, was from Dick uh, congratulating me on, on getting that record. And it's really stuck in my mind because it was an odd um, time at, probably in New Zealand and he took the time out to congratulate me on, on my achievement and breaking his record. Adrian Blinko. Silver Ferns defender Kelly Jury has been ruled out of the Waikato Bay of Plenty Magic for the rest of the ANZ Premiership season after dislocating her right shoulder in round two. A scan revealed a tear within the shoulder post-dislocation and surgery is expected within the next month to repair it. Rafael Nadal, Novak Djokovic and Stan Wawrinka, winners of 12 of the past 13 French Open tennis titles, are all in action in Paris tonight. Nadal is trying to become the first man and the only the second player in history to win 11 singles titles at any Grand Slam tournament. Caroline Wozniacki, Petra Kvitova and Maria Sharapova also play their first round matches tonight. That's the news. Tonight on Nights we have a window on the world of mass catering. As demonstrated by a Sikh temple at festival time. Reckon they should check out a hangi while they're at it. Peter Lamp has provincial sport in his sights. And Anya Tate Manning talks about her one-woman show, My Best Dead Friend. A joyful comedy from a heavy heart. And unlike Brian, I can't tell you exactly what we're up to because it's an ever-changing landscape as we head towards 10pm. I do know we'll wrap up the day's news in the long bulletin at 10 and I'll be talking to newsmakers from around the country with an eye on international events from the Foreign Desk. That's Lately with Karen Hay, live between 10 and 11 weeknights on RNZ National. Met service weather through to midnight tomorrow. Northland to Taumaranui, also Coromandel Bay of Plenty and Taupo. Fine with morning frosts in sheltered places. Taranaki, Whanganui and Taihepe to the Kapiti coast. Scattered showers with snow above 700 metres, easing by this evening and becoming confined to high ground tomorrow. 
Kismin to Wairarapa and Wellington, showers some heavy with hail, easing from the south this evening, southerly gales about the coast easing tonight. Coastal Marlborough and Canterbury, scattered showers with snow above 500 metres, clearing in the south and about the high country by this evening and becoming confined to Christchurch and Banks Peninsula tomorrow. Inland Marlborough, Nelson, Buller, Westland and Fiordland, fine with morning frosts. Otago and Southland, remaining coastal showers clearing by this evening, then fine and frosty. And the Chatham Islands, showers with gale southerlies easing tonight. It's almost nine minutes past six, funded through New Zealand on air. You're listening to Checkpoint with thank, John Campbell. Thank you, and Katrina Baden. Thank you, Katrina, and thanks everyone for being with us. Federated Farmers called it having a crack. Whatever language you use, the government says the country has just one shot at eradicating the cattle disease. Mycoplasma bovis. Its phased eradication plan, which has an estimated price tag of $886 million, will see around 150,000 cattle slaughtered. Success is by no means guaranteed, and as political reporter Benedict Collins reports, some farmers are warning it's already too late. The disease has bolted. Cabinet has today uh, joined with industry and collectively decided to attempt the eradication of the cattle disease Mycoplasma bovis from New Zealand. We've made this decision in partnership with our farming sector to protect our national herd and the long-term productivity of our economic base. The Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern announcing the government's much-anticipated decision to try to eradicate Mycoplasma bovis in Wellington this afternoon. The bacterial disease, which causes a range of illnesses in cattle, including arthritis, mastitis, pneumonia and abortions, was found in Oamaru last July. And while it's not clear the eradication plan will succeed, Ms Ardern says it's worth a shot. I personally do not want to look back on this time, having seen the full impact of this disease on the productivity of our farming sector and the well-being of our rural communities and say, I wish we had tried harder. The Ministry for Primary Industries Director of Readiness and Response, Jeff Gwynn, says officials believe all infected farms are linked to the same network, which makes them confident eradication is possible. Mr Gwynn says 858 farms are now under surveillance. We currently have 37 um, infected properties and we have 67 restricted places. Those are the areas where we have either found live disease or we have a strong suspicion we will. The notice of direction, which would be the others you'd be aware of, uh, number some 200, uh, those uh, have had a high risk event and we're trying to determine disease status. But I think the takeaway is we, have, we believe it's on 67 farms in New Zealand. And that's it. But the officials aren't certain their plan will succeed and they'll reassess in spring after calving when it becomes clearer if the disease has spread further than they suspect. I don't think there's any cast iron guarantee here. I think what we're doing is um, having the best shot at eradication. Um, I think uh, David said if we don't have a shot at it now, um, it's gone, it's off the table for good. But is there a 100% guarantee? No, there isn't. I would say it's not been attempted internationally, but I think we can do it. But a Southland dairy farmer doubts that very much. Jim Andrew milks 800 cows near Dipton, and he reckons MPI has got it wrong. And there are far more infected farms than it estimates. He says it's way too late to try to eradicate the disease, which is now present in every country apart from Norway. On all farms, there's a significant amount of stock which just drifts out and is sold. Probably... It shouldn't, but maybe cashies and milks just sold at the gate basically to large calf rearers sometimes. And so there's there's this huge area that we haven't even touched yet of, of this disease and that's, that's why I'm saying the horse has already bolted, now let's get on with the long-term control of it. And, and that's what everybody's thinking. Mr Andrew says it will be a $1 billion waste of money. The Agriculture and Biosecurity Minister, Damien O'Connor, acknowledges farmers are divided over the move. I know there will be farmers who debate this decision. I've had calls and emails from some saying cull the herds and others saying stop the culling. It's really tough on the families who are directly in the firing line of this uh, de terrible disease. Um, it's up to us to work together and to support them. Mr O'Connor says cattle will be culled on all infected farms and most restricted farms and any farms that test positive in the future. The cost of the government response, including compensation to farmers, is estimated at $870 million. 
the government will meet just over two-thirds of this cost, with Dairy NZ and Beef and Lamb picking up the rest. And farmers are being promised that the compensation process will be sped up, with a fully verified claim taking between two and three weeks. From Parliament for Checkpoint, Benedict Collins. Meanwhile, the decision to eradicate Mycoplasma bovis may mean the end of dairying for Waikato farmer Hank Smith. Mr Smith, whose farm is the first in the Waikato region to test positive, told our reporter Zach Fleming after hearing of the decision that he no longer has the energy to start again once his herd is culled. Now, NPI confirmed last week a farm owned by Alphons and Gia Zestraten in Southland had the earliest known Mycoplasma bovis infection. Well, Hank Smith told Zach and our cameraman Nick Monroe he he purchased a herd of cows from that farm two years ago. I got in contact with Alphonse and he told me he had 600 cows for sale. And on the 1st of June 2016 I uh, flew down south and I uh, picked 240 cows out of the 600. Those were the cows that I liked and, uh, and sort of in the following two weeks these cows were tracked up to the North Island. And never had any issues with them? No. no. Nothing. No. And then what, sometime last year you found out that Alphonse had bovis on his farm and did you straight away put two and two together and think that the cows that you bought from him a year earlier could also have bovis? Uh, Alphonse rang me in the first week of December 2017 and he said, Hank, uh, we've just been diagnosed uh, with having bovis in the cows. I thought, uh, you should know. And what do you mean you should know? Well, that's what he said to me, you know. I think you should know that. Oh, right, right. Yeah, and that's why you rang. And um, I expected a phone call from MPI within the next few days. Uh, so that's instantly what went to your mind, yeah. that, that the cows that you bought off him more than a year ago probably had bovis? It has the potential of some. Uh, some of them have the potential of having bovis. Uh, but it took six weeks before they had the first phone call of MPI. So the first uh, contact, I think it was the 14th of January. At that stage, the chap that I spoke to, he wasn't aware that the 240 cows that I trucked up went to three different farms. Um, and but I explained it to him that I only landed 40 cows on this farm. There's 90 cows on another farm and 110 cows on the third farm. And, uh, and he said, oh, we'll be in touch. And Did he sound concerned once you told him that they were spread across three different farms? No, I mean, the guy is just doing his job, you know. Um, and well, we had a few phone calls uh, through February about it. And on the 5th of March, there was a chap turned up here and uh, he brought me uh, a note, a notice of direction, that I uh, was restricted in my movement of cattle. Uh, At all three of those farms? Yeah, I mean, one farm uh, isn't, is, doesn't belong to me. Uh, there was a, a different party. Um, but all three farms were put under uh, notice of direction. And then, I think, ten days later, they started butt testing the cows. Uh, and for me, it's the easiest to speak about my farm here because I, I work with the animals. I understand uh, what happened here. Um, and 15th of March, 16th of March, the blood tests, uh, the blood samples went to the lab. 18th of March, uh, they came out of the lab. And it was not until the 7th of April that I got approached by MPI that there was a problem here. And that problem is they believe that M. bovis was on the farm? Well, I think it's for people that don't quite understand uh, what's going on, the blood test is only testing if animals are carrying antibodies against mycoplasma. Uh, so they identified the number of animals on the farm here that have antibodies against mycoplasma. Uh, and then there's, I think, 166 different mycoplasmas. So then they have to identify which one it is. And for this farm here, they haven't been able to identify which mycoplasma it is because you have to find the, the, the hmm. bacteria and they, they searched the blood test, the, the blood samples, couldn't find the bacteria, couldn't find no uh, bacterial DNA in there. Um, then we did nasal swaps on, uh, on the positive cows. That hasn't uh, brought up anything. Uh, 
every day my milk is being picked up. The milk is tested if it contains uh, bovis. And so far on this farm, nothing uh, has been found. The affected property, that's where about three weeks ago the bovis all of a sudden appeared in the milk. Even then, in the blood samples and nasal uh, swaps, I haven't been able to find, find anything. Do you regret buying those cows off Alphons? No. Nah. Look, I've done lots of things in life uh, where you think maybe I shouldn't have done that, but no, I don't think uh, regret is a good thing. Uh, it's happened, you learn from it. And I love those cows. Alphons uh, is a very good farmer. Uh, he's a good breeder of stock and he had the type of cows that I like. And I mean, I was there on the 1st of June 2016 and he took me over his whole property. And uh, his, the property is, is split in three operations. And uh, he might have had some cattle grazing away on his farm. But what I saw there, it was all tip top, you know, the animals were good. Hank Smith talking to Zach Fleming. Now, Hank went on to say he'd sent weaned calves from his infected property to Kaitaia for grazing 18 months ago. What I've understood now is uh, the transfer of bovis from animal to animal is almost minimal uh, in, in the animal to animal contact. What I've seen is uh, the vector, the biggest vector is milk, contaminated milk contaminated with bovis, drunk by little calves, and that's a perfect way of almost infecting 100% of the mob. Uh, so now in hindsight, on the infected property, we reared calves there, and there's a very, very good chance that a number, if not all of them, are uh, positive. Uh, a number of these animals we sold as weaners, but these went, uh, went up, up north, and uh, they were due to come home last week. Uh, well, it was due to come home earlier, but it didn't happen until last week uh, because uh, the logistics is not always easy from all the way uh, Kataya to Cambridge. Um, and then all of a sudden we realised these animals can't come on the farm because uh, the farm is infected place and you're not allowed to bring anything on. I rang MPI uh, and I said the safest place for these animals is on the infected property, you, you've got to give us dispensation. And he said, no way, you're not allowed to bring them. We weren't sure what to do with the cattle, because you can't land anyone else uh, with this cattle uh, being potentially infected. No one else probably wants it, do they? No, and I mean, if you bring it, you have to disclose it. Um, so in the end, uh, fr uh, Monday night last week, uh, they were dropped off at the freezing works in Tikawiti to be killed the next morning. And then the next morning they realised on the paperwork, they said these animals were under withholding um, for sadectin, uh, so they couldn't be uh, killed for the next three weeks. So these animals have gone to grazing uh, in the someone else's cattle. Uh, and I told that story at the meeting uh, on Friday, and. You now I've got a call uh, uh, today that there's a permit there for these cattle to come back on the infected property. You said you've had death threats and, and your children have been like, bullied and, and can, those sorts of things. Is that, uh, is that, that happening? With, 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 my, uh, with my kids, uh, that was earlier on already, you know, because there was, there was whispers. Uh, what was happening to them? Oh, I'll give you, for instance, uh, my, my youngest son, uh, he's on another farm, but he plays rugby. Uh, but he turns up for rugby practice and uh, his team asks him to have a shower first, you know, because they don't want to play with him. Particularly after I spoke on Friday, uh, I, um, I've had a lot of phone calls, uh, a lot of messages, a lot of texts, and uh, I would say 98% of, of it was in support. Uh, but it's, unfortunately uh, there's a few loonies out there yeah, and uh, even, uh, I mean, I don't take my phone at night time, uh, but overnight uh, of this morning I picked, uh, picked up a message yeah, that wasn't very attractive. What do you mean not very attractive? Oh, that I have to watch my back. That is Hank Smith talking to our reporter, Zach Fleming. Just before we move on with the time of 23 minutes past six, a statement in from the police about 
uh, this tragic accident or incident near Palmerston North. Um, this is uh, attributed to uh, Central District Commander Superintendent Sue Schwalger. Early today, Central Communications issued a dispatch notifying local Palmerston North units of a vehicle of interest possibly being driven by a 15-year-old male who was breaching his bail conditions. We're told at about 1.30 an officer saw the wanted Sabari being driven on Monrad Street. Police signalled for the vehicle to pull over and the driver failed to stop. The Sabaru continued driving, travelling onto Pioneer Highway and crashed into a ditch, hitting a power pole at the intersection of Shrifts, Shrifts Road. Sadly, the 15-year-old driver died later this afternoon. His passenger, believed to be a 12-year-old girl, died at the scene. That in from police a short time ago. It's 24 minutes past six. Over the weekend, Ireland voted by a landslide to legalise abortion, a stunning outcome that marks a dramatic defeat for the Catholic Church's one-time domination of the country. Now, following what the Irish president, Michael Higgins, described as a quiet revolution, the focus has shifted north of the border. Pressure is mounting on Prime Minister Theresa May to push for a referendum on relaxing abortion laws in Northern Ireland. From Belfast, this report from the BBC. This was a seismic moment, marking a shift away from the country's once strict conservative beliefs. Two thirds of Irish voters back repealing the ban on abortion, and the reverberations of this decision are being felt elsewhere. This has very much been a national debate. People the length and breadth of the island have been talking about how we need to support women. Our, our policy is the same from the north of Ireland right to the bottom of Ireland. We want to see the same policy. We need to show care and compassion towards women. Ice cream, ice cream. In Belfast today, a sense that the debate now moves here. Northern Ireland remains the only part of the UK where abortion is illegal unless there's a risk to a woman's life. I would love to see a referendum up here. Um, again, political parties, you know, probably it will never happen, but um, hopefully it will, it will start a bit of a conversation going. I would love the same sort of vote up here, so I would. Uh, Could it happen? I don't know, not with our government. <laughs> Northern Ireland's devolved government collapsed 16 months ago, and the largest party here doesn't want restrictions on abortion to change. The DUP leader, Arlene Foster, has said her party will keep its pro-life position and that referendum in the South will have no impact on the law up here. I think there's a lot of people who would never vote for the DUP, who would share my analysis of, the, of life and when life begins and the, the need to protect life. So I think it is a, a popular opinion throughout uh, Northern Ireland that we should uh, not have a liberalised abortion regime. We should not have the 1967 Abortion Act here. But uh, as I say, <coughs> in the absence of a devolved assembly, uh, there's no possibility for discussion on those issues. The priority is to restore devolution, say number 10, so Northern Ireland politicians can decide. But a number of MPs, including some from within the Tory ranks, believe Westminster should pass more Liberal legislation for Northern Ireland. Compassion doesn't equal abortion, so now that the eyes turn to Belfast and to Westminster, we would say because both lives matter, there is a better story and we would ask our politicians to respect democracy and devolution, to give the people of Northern Ireland a chance to decide on what goes forward and don't impose anything upon us. But the resounding yes vote in the South means there's growing political pressure those who now see Northern Ireland as drastically out of step. The BBC's Emma Vardy with that report. 27 past six, flash floods have again struck a town in the east coast US state of Maryland, still recovering after a similar disaster in 2016. Ellicott City's main street turned into a raging river that reached the first floor of some buildings, sweeping away parked cars and causing at least one building to collapse. Officials believe it could be worse than last time, although no injuries or deaths have been reported so far, which is quite extraordinary when you see the water. CNN's Isaacs reports. Uh, to see it torn up again like this, you know, it's it, it, it does hurt. Not even two years later, a vibrant city once again thrown into turmoil as devastating flooding tore through Ellicott City, forcing lots of people to evacuate. The floor was flooded with water. Uh, water was coming in through the walls. Pat Hyden was eating at a restaurant when it started to fill with water. The waiters was like, no. All the cars in the parking lot are flooded. 
Thankfully, they were able to get help and get out safely. In the middle of the storm, a Baltimore couple on their wedding day, they had to relocate to a restaurant and were able to say their I do's before being evacuated again. I married the girl of my dreams. Um, we're just happy everyone's safe. We're still trying to get people safe. Uh, it was a chaotic day. Ellicott City was just getting back to normal, and actually more businesses were open than before the 2016 flood. It was incredible. Uh, so many of the businesses did come back, and some didn't. And now with this happening so close again, we're going to have to watch that all over again. It's hard to see. Every time it rains here, the community heart stops. And I just, I don't know what we're going to do, but I can tell you that Ellicott City is the strongest community I've ever been a part of. We're going to rebuild this place the best we can. As the water recedes, a determination has set in yet again to show the world what Ellicott City strong means. It takes a lot of work to come back after something like this, but I think they will. The community will pull together and we'll do it again. Ken Kisler, a resident of Ellicott City in Maryland, ending that report from CNN and ending the program for tonight. Thank you all of uh, you who have, many of you have been in touch with us about mycoplasma bovis. There does seem to be a consensus that the government had no choice, although a few of you are saying, hey, hold on a sec. Weren't farmers saying, trust us to take care of our own industry? Get away government, get away regulations, get away MBI. We can do this well. It seems not. Some of you are suggesting uh, quite a lot of anger around this car chase in Palmerston North. The facts aren't yet known. Obviously, Morning Report will look at that tomorrow morning. Thank you uh, for your feedback and for your company. We really appreciate it. On behalf of the Checkpoint team, it's a pleasure being with you. We'll be back tomorrow at 5. RNZ News Headlines at 6.30. The government says it will spend more than half a billion dollars in an effort to eradicate Mycoplasma bovis from New Zealand farms. A 15-year-old boy and a 12-year-old girl are dead and another passenger is in hospital following a police pursuit in Palmerston North this afternoon. The police say the boy who was driving was breaching his bail conditions. DHBs have upped their latest offer to nurses in a new pay deal they hope will stop nurses striking. The county's Monaco DHB will extend hours in some departments in response to a staffing crisis at Middlemore Hospital. And the principal of a Manurewa school says those responsible for an assault that put a teenager in hospital will be held accountable. Our next news and weather is at 7. The top-rated RNZ app makes it easy to browse and enjoy all our features, articles, stories and readings and live performances. They'll be Kermit, Bert and Ernie, The Count. Do you remember The you Count? Remember the count.